So hello and welcome to this special Women's Day interview series for News 9. I'm delighted to be joined by one of my favorite Carnatic vocalists, Aishwarya Vidya Raghunath, who I got to know very recently. Welcome, Aishwarya. Thank you. Thank you, Devi and Asu. Exciting to be a part of this series. And as always, I love conversing with you. Thank you. Thank you, Aishwarya. So um, the in this series, we're talking to... Uh, a group of uh, Hindustani and Carnatic uh, women vocalist musicians. And uh, I'd like you to begin by telling us about how it all began for you. How did you, uh, who were your gurus? What was the kind of training? How many years did it continue? Just give us a background. Okay. So for me, it began at the age of three. Uh, till the age of three, my grandmother would sing to put me to sleep. So Really, that's where it started for me. And she'd sing to feed me. She'd sing to put me to sleep. And she'd take me for concerts with her. Uh, close to where she lived, there was a venue where concerts were held for occasions like Shivaratri. Bangalore. In Bangalore. In Bangalore, yeah. So right. there was this Odukatur Mutt where, you know, it, it was like a hall in a temple premises. But different organizations would have series like Gokulashtami or Shivaratri. And it was very close to where she lived. So I'd hold her hand and we'd, we'd go for the concerts together. And uh, that really, I think, was very, very unique for me because I, I heard a lot of live music at a very young age. And hence, I guess, the inspiration to want to learn it as well. And uh, both my maternal and my paternal grandparents were very, very invested in, in music and had a background with, you know, concert listening and also being having been taught by some very good gurus at home. So they said that, you know, she must start learning music. So at the age yes. of three, I was taken for my first music lesson with, with Srimati P.S. Vasanta, who is an, you know, a graded artist at the, at the All India Radio, and she lived very close to home. And, um, you know, my first lesson, I couldn't read at the age of three. So she, she didn't realize that I was that young. And she put that little music book in front of me and said, uh, okay, what do, you, what do you see? And I said, I don't know any of this. <laughs> she said, all right, from now on, our music is going to be oral. There's going to be no written stuff for you. And then you're just going to use your hearing. And, you know, that's how you're going to internalize music. So I was with her for about seven years. And then I switched to Srimati Sita Lakshmi Venkateshan, uh, a very renowned and exemplary guru who lived in Bangalore. And um, from the age of 10, maybe for about 13 years, I was with her. And um, somewhere in 2006, actually it was this guru, Srimati Sita Lakshmi Venkateshan's, uh, I think, I, insight and also you know her generosity in allowing me to learn from other gurus as well because you know that's that's a very sensitive thing in this area yeah. of arena yeah. carnatic music so she was very gracious and said you know i think you need to also learn from uh, other gurus as well and uh, shri ps narayan swami is a wonderful musician with a huge repertoire and i've known him because both of us learned from the same guru who is shri shamangudi shrinivasayar and um, she sent me for a workshop of his, and that was my first introduction to uh, P.S. and Mama, as he's fondly referred to as. Mm -hmm. And uh, following which, um, I also, I think simultaneously wanted to learn from Srimati Vegavahini Vijay Raghavan, daughter of um, the legendary musician T. Brinda of the Dhanamal School. And um, in Carnatic music, the Dhanamal School is one of those schools of music that is extremely very niche, you know, and considered to be very difficult to learn. And uh, also also a very, very different Carnatic music approach in their music. So uh, Srimati Vegavahini Vijay Raghavan and my grandmother went to the same school. And uh, so my grandmom said, oh, I know her, you know, um, we should, we should totally have you learning from her. And this is a wonderful thing. And so when I went to Vegama, she, she already knew of me because of, you know, and a very old association with the family and also, you know, being distantly relate, related to us. Uh, so um, I think 
2006 was when I began learning from both PSN Mama as well as Srimati Vegavahini Vijay Raghavan almost on the same day. So hence the marriage between Shemangudi and uh, the Shemangudi Bani and the Danamar Bani for me. And it's been, I've been uh, also fortunate to have begun learning from Sri R.K. Sri Ram Kumar five or six years ago. And, uh, and I, I think I'm very lucky to have had such gurus because such a, such an, uh, a different perspective from each of them into Carnatic music. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned so much from all of them, not, not just as musicians, but also as personalities and in terms of musical values and virtues. So, and I've been with them right. since now. Right. So, um, you know, the person who's not from the world of classical music, this all sounds like you need to invest a great deal of time and effort. Um, how do you, how, that is true, right? Very I mean, much so. Need, how yeah. regular, how regularly would you visit at different times of your training? So I mean, with the, uh, with uh, my first two gurus who were in Bangalore, it was a few times a week. Uh, okay. With uh, Sita Lakshmi Mami, it was regular and very rigorous because she'd, you know, she'd started introducing me to concert performance and and hence the uh, increase in rigor and uh, you know training. Mm -hmm. It was a couple of times a week, and with uh, PSN Mama and Vegama, who both lived in Chennai at that time, it was weekends. So I, you know, my mom uh, would would come with me for classes. We'd leave on Friday night and come back on Monday morning. And very often, my dad would drive me from Bangalore to Chennai for classes or for concerts. So I think with with something like musical training, especially in the formative years, you know, having having regularity is is very very helpful and is necessary. I would think so. At least, at least two weekends a month in Chennai, and you know, um, two days a week in Bangalore. So it was pretty, pretty rigorous. Right, and also time for practice for your own practice correct. when you're not going to your teachers. Correct, right? correct, correct. Very much so. And my parents were pretty uh, strict about how disciplined it, it was for me as a child. Uh, I remember my mom got me a planner in grade seven <laughs> and then she said, I think the only way you're going to be able to do what you like is to put down a timetable for yourself. So I had it, I had it all written down and I was asked to tick every time I did what I was supposed to do at that time. That really helped. Honestly, it really helped. It was a little difficult for a child, but I think that really helped. Right, right. So, Aishwarya, you're not, not only are you a very accomplished Carnatic musician, you're also, you have more facets to your uh, life and your personality. You, uh, you had a career in technology. How did all that happen? How did it happen parallelly to your, uh, and what is your sense of yourself? I mean, are you, do you see yourself as primarily and completely a musician? Or do you think that while music is a large part of you, there are other things as well to your personality. How do you look at that? So for me as a, as a student in say grade seven, eight, nine, and 10, it was, it was all about biology. I loved biology and um, I always wanted to do something with biology and hence uh, an interest to pursue biotechnology because when I joined uh, biotechnology engineering, it was, it was one of those fields that uh, you know, was promised to, uh, had, had a lot of promise to grow as, as, you know, in terms of opportunity and in terms of research and, and so on. And Bangalore was also considered one of those places which had ample opportunity for biotechnology. So I think 10th grade was when I decided I wanted to positively do something with biology and hence got into biotechnology engineering at PESIT in Bangalore, one of Bangalore's very premier institutes for engineering. And right. um, throughout engineering, I was exposed to a variety of subjects related to biology, you know, very varied, you know, straight from microbiology to molecular biology to biochemistry and so on. So I said, you know, maybe I must do a PhD in one of these subjects because it was so fascinating. And it was so new in, in uh, so many, so many ways. So then I applied for a PhD program and 
uh, in the penultimate interview stage, I was preparing for the final interview. And, and at, I think at that point in time, I, I sat and thought to myself, you know, there's this, there's this huge passion that I have for music and a real interest in pursuing it as a career. And hey, should I be doing this as well? So I think I, I decided at that point, maybe I, I will try and work in a biotechnological firm. I worked with Biocon for a while. And uh, it was at that point, um, you know, the, the work was so, so, so long, you know, my days were really long and the time I had for music was very limited and, and I was not able to fulfill my passion for music at that time. So one fine day I said, I'm just going to do music. And um, really my parents went all out in supporting me, Devina, you know, I think that is such an important thing because music is one of those things which, uh, you know, you, it, it's not guaranteed your path to success or your path to establishing yourself is not really guaranteed. And um, unlike say- it takes, uh, it takes forever to get anywhere, I mean. Yeah. Irrespective of how much you've put into it. Very much so. Very much so. So because of the uncertainty involved, you know, it also took me a bit of time to, you know, reconcile and say, guess what? I'm, I'm in it for the long haul and I'm willing to take whatever, you know, put in whatever it takes and risks included. And, you know, my parents really put their foot down and said, you must do what you like because, you know, not too many people have this opportunity to learn from some of the best gurus and, and, you know, have an opportunity to attend so many concerts, practice and have guidance from so many different people. So that was when I said this was in 2012. And I said, I must do music full time. But coming back to your second question on just music or otherwise, um, I actually have a passion for, for so many things. Um, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, in one of my morning walks in the Nilgiris, I met an elderly gentleman. Uh, he was standing and looking at, at the trees above. And I stopped by to ask him what he was doing because he, he was well into his 80s. And he said, do you hear that? I said, hear what? And he said, that is the sound of a wobbler. That bird that you hear is a warbler. He, it's this tiny and I think you must try and see where it is. And really that started my interest in bird watching because uh, for the next few days, I said, let me know when you're going out and I wanna, I wanna come with you and learn a little bit about this from you. And um, I think that was when I also had my first camera. So I went out with my camera and this gentleman helped me identify he said, you just have to listen and you'll identify the birds. You don't even have to see them. You know, the bird calls are so beautiful and so unique. So he introduced me to bird watching and, and hence photography. And uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, interact with one Mr. Prasad Natarajan of the Artists for Wildlife and Nature. And uh, it, his, his ideas were very interesting. To bring in art, uh, towards the purpose of conservation of wildlife and, and nature. And I thought that made a lot of sense because I did have a flair for painting as well of different types, acrylics and charcoal and watercolors and oils. And, Have you learned uh, it formally? Had you uh, learned uh, painting formally? Well, in school, I went for art classes, but I did attend some workshops by some very well-known artists and kind of picked up a few skills from everybody. And from then on, I've been self-taught and kind of figured out my own little way of, of you know, putting my thoughts onto the canvas. So, um, so I thought that this was a very, very interesting venue because it brought together all my, all my interests of bird watching and photography and art because, you know, bird watching and then I take my pictures and then I paint from my own references. And then the thought that all of this was going towards something more meaningful really really sealed it for me you know in terms of here's what's here's what I really want to do outside of music to harness my my passion for for painting and 
you know, for a meaningful cause like conservation. And we did some exhibitions together, a few of us, about 10 of us who had a similar passion and a similar interest. So this was pre-pandemic, of course, in the last couple of years, this hasn't happened, but I'm pretty sure it will resume once things are back to normal. But this was very interesting because I got to meet a lot of artists with different interests and you know, different techniques. And that's when you engage with the community and when everybody is in it for a greater purpose, then it makes it all the more meaningful. Yes, yes. that's wonderful, uh, Aishwarya. Um, coming back to um, your perspective as a younger classical musician, um, what do you feel about the way the classical music, Karnati classical music uh, ecosystem is uh, functioning, is built? As a younger classical musician, are there changes you'd like to see? Are there times that you feel that it's uh, a little challenging for musicians to get in there, to be taken seriously? And uh, what are the kind of changes you'd like to see? So I feel the, the, the current ecosystem is, is very unique because there are, there are so many young musicians, my peers, younger than me and also slightly older than me, all of whom who've uh, dedicated their uh, careers, you know, towards music. And that's that's very different because there are a lot more people taking the plunge and a lot, a lot more people willing to uh, do this full time. Uh, and that's mm. really refreshing to see. I think the mm. current generation also has more people, uh, you know, coming together and and talking and uh, discussing, having conversations about, about various things and not necessarily music alone. So there's a lot of um, give and take happening, a lot of different kinds of associations. And uh, I think the nice thing is that we also have a very nice bridge with some of the older musicians. And uh, unlike perhaps how it would have been for them and their previous generation of music musicians, it's, it feels a lot more fluid and, you know, the ability to musically and otherwise converse. So I think that's a very, very unique and different space that we see now as Carnatic musicians of this generation. Uh, what I'd like to see is, is um, equal respect for musicians across all backgrounds, all ages, all genders, you know, I think that's, that's something that that really would um, unify people and make this a more wholesome uh, environment. So I think respect, equal opportunity for for women musicians and male musicians, uh, opportunity for for younger musicians, opportunity for those who need not necessarily have their uh, you know social media game going because. Things have changed so much now. And of course, social media has really helped reach music across to a much wider audience. But I think I think more opportunity for people who need not necessarily have the ammunition to throw themselves out there. I think that's something that we could work together collectively because now so many things have opened up for us. And also very much um, like how we'd see uh, you know, in, in, in a Western music classical orchestra where we only know of the conductor and not necessarily the multiple musicians who are who have their little bit going to for the wholesome experience of the music itself. I think a lot of a lot of musicians have their own unique um, USP that they can bring forth to uh, make this a very, very different experience. And I think, I think bringing out and drawing each of these musicians and to have a collective kind of a thing going is is something that we should work towards. Right, right. Um, a lot of younger musicians have talked about having more opportunities, more, let's say, residencies, different kinds of formats of engagement apart from the concert. You know, right. there's there's a lot that can that can actually happen uh, in these ways. Um, what about uh, your expectations as a younger musician, a musician of today, from 
organizers from um, let's say even the media you know when they write about classical music um, organizers from patrons from sponsors do you think that there's something more that you'd like there more finesse more nuance that there's there's often something missing there too so um uh, in all honesty, it's 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 changed a lot now because there are so many more organizations than there have been before, and mm. a lot more online organizations in the last couple of years as well. So mm. I think I think what we're seeing is a change where we we hear of so many youngsters singing online, right? So if you if you log into Facebook, there's always mm. a concert happening, and there's always a youngster singing from home with with co-artists. So I think, I think that I think it is changing. I think it is changing, and um, I think it could continue to encourage youngsters and not just online but offline as well, because everybody is looking for for names. And uh, while that is a good thing, I think mixing it up a little bit with with those who are known with you know and those who are unknown will will help balance it out a little bit. And yes. again, I like I said in the in my previous point, I think equal opportunity for women and men is is very important you know i think i think that that we can look forward to in the coming yeah yeah, yeah. right um coming to <laughs> sorry the way that uh, the training process the long arduous years of you know uh, pursuing this art form especially in the formative years as you said, um is the relationship between the guru and the shishya set to change is it changing in your time and um, because there's this there's this background of you know uh, it's a difficult art form to learn so some degree of fear and intimidation seems to be an you know part of the whole process right. uh, can it not be replaced with mutual respect and trust between the teacher and the student today you know, I mean, uh, in in the in the sort of imagination, in the popular imagination, it's like these very strict gurus who, you know, of course, strictness is required. But right. uh, don't you think that relationship, fear intimidation? Do you really think it can it works today or? No, I that... don't think fear works anymore. I don't think fear works anymore. And um, I think in my case, Devina, I I was That's fortunate to have gurus. Sorry. Yeah, I mean fear, intimidation, obedience. You know the, the right. words like that, rather than a more modern, more equal, more progressive. Correct. Uh, relationship. Correct. I think I think you're right. It has to be. It has. There has to be a, a relationship between the guru and the shishya that is not formidable. You know, it the, the shishya should look forward to classes and. Um, I, I think that is changing now. I think that is that is definitely changing now. And I think that balance between between rigor and strictness and say um, friendly and less intimidating, I think I think that that is an important balance that needs to be struck now. Yes. In my case, although my gurus were all of the, the not just the previous generation but the generation before that, they were extremely different in their thinking, you know, very forward in the way they approach things. Yes, there was a strictness and there was an expectation that, you know, you come prepared for class, you're thorough in whatever you've learned so far, you don't refer to notes, you know, little things like this. And I ask you for a song in the middle of the night, you're going to be able to sit up and sing it because that's how thorough you have to be, which is a good thing. And it wasn't imposed. It, it was an unsaid expectation. And in turn, I got so much of love and, and affection from my gurus. And I think, I think that positive reinforcement really, really helps. You know, with, mm. with, with all my gurus, there is, there is a sense of anticipation on going to class. You know, you're going to learn something. You'll probably get some, some nice little stories from what happened decades ago some little stories about personal experiences so i think that uh, that that balance in the way classes are held will will really enable more people to learn without fear without trepidation without uh, mm. you know Correct. 
any feeling. You're right. Yeah. Right. Uh, another thing I've always wanted to ask musicians is when you reach a certain level in your training and in your career, after that, how does an artist like yourself continue to learn and continue to self-assess? You know, this process of how does that happen and what, what, what does that involve? So it works, it works two ways. Um, mm -hmm. The first is your constant learnings with your guru, right? So you have, you have somebody there who's constantly guiding you and telling you that, uh, you know, I think this works. I think this may not work. And obviously the guru is coming from, from, from far greater experience than you are. And that is very insightful. So to have a guru like that, who, who constantly pushes you to explore more, to, to think more, to in, introspect more. So not only is it looking at current trends and, the, and, and of course, technical aspects, but also thinking about, about, uh, you know, how to push the student to think differently, to work differently, to introspect differently. So once you have that, that push from your guru, and then you sit back and, you know, I think, I think for all musicians, this is the case, you have to sit quietly in a room and keep singing and keep trying the different things, keep listening. You know, you have to be aware of what, not just your peers, but also the previous generation of musicians has done. Are you trying to do something that's a little different? Not necessarily in terms of presentation alone, but also in terms of the music material. itself, material. So I, I think I think it's 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 a very 360 degree approach, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's a constant process. There's no there's no stopping. Right, right. And there's there's enough uh, space and time to craft a individual journey after a point, because that's the point of the music, right? right. After, a, after you've internalized and reached a certain level, finding yourself in the music. Correct. Correct. Right? Correct. I also think musical exchanges with other artists help, you know, be it on stage or, or your peers. You know, when you sit and sing with somebody, there's, there's always something that you realize. There's always a realization. There's always a learning. There's always something that clicks and something that occurs to you that you think maybe you need to work on and think about. Right, right. Not musically and, and also in terms of, of thought, thought processes. Yes, yes. Do you, so how many hours of work do you put in now roughly as a musician into the music? That's, even that's today? a little difficult to say, Devina, because uh, the day encompasses... Uh, learning it encompasses listening then you you practice and then you try and put everything together and then you teach and then you know it's 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 music all through right yes. in different forms so it's it's hard to put a time to it but yeah. I think it's constantly there in the background and it's constantly there in the subconscious right in some way or the other yeah. Are you also drawn to other forms of music and or and, or is it do you make a point to listen to other forms of music? Oh, I'm drawn to so many different kinds of music. I love Western classical. I love I love soft rock. I, I love listening to the Beatles. I like Pink Floyd. I like Snarky Puppy. I like uh, uh, in fact, um, I chanced upon this 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 band called Kinari Wen. Uh, Middle Eastern band and uh, their music is really is very different because it's it's so raw it's uh, it's it's a tr it's tribal and it's very raw but then you see you see hints of rock there and and it's a, it, it said that you know rock originated from from here so I like listening to Turkish music I love Hindustani music so yes I I enjoy listening to various different kinds of music Right, right. That's lovely. So the last question I want to ask you, Ashwarya, sure. is do sure. you worry about the kind of audiences that musicians are getting today? What is it that you can do to help as a musician to help nurture audiences to explain your art form? Because it does take time to get into uh, this music. It's it's uh, you the, the listener needs to invest himself or herself in it a little bit at least. So what sure. is it that you musicians can do to uh, you know make that happen so um 
I think the relationship between the audience and the artist is, is very special. And a live concert is very different from anything you see online because there's so much that's, that's going in between the audience and the performing musicians, you know? The artist draws in from the audience, draws in from the pulse of the audience and gives back to the audience. So it's, it's very real and it's very happening at a live concert. I think to involve more people because Carnatic mu music audiences are very niche. To involve more people, perhaps um, some, some master classes in schools or colleges, uh, little workshops, explaining what music is. I mean, no force, but just, just a little peep into Carnatic music. So, so it might fascinate a few to take it up either, either, either as a passion or just to listen, little things like that. Also curating Carnatic music content in a different way. You know, it could be thematic. It could be like Blue Planet, right? Which, which yeah. aims to, to cover more than just Carnatic music, but also create ecological and environmental awareness through music and dance, which are yeah. great cultural unifiers. And yeah. um, interestingly, music as an ability it is said that it actually even precedes language ability, you know. Yes. So, so people who don't don't necessarily converse with a common mm -hmm. language can actually converse with music. You may you may see it as something that's that's something that you can't relate to, but in terms of maybe lyrics, but the music I feel is a very is a very binding universal. factor. It's very universal. So. Right. It doesn't have to be through lyric, but you can just hum a tune and then get people to join in, you know, be it a school or a university or anywhere. So little outlets like this where you can reach out to people across cultures, across, you know, various barriers. And, you know, it's like, for example, even like Blue Planet itself draws a, a global audience to an issue that that is very Indian you know, in terms of um, the, the various associations with NGOs that, that different mus musicians have uh, forged through Blue Planet and the idea that you connect with, with a society and with, through, through, through the community and um, through community. And, yes. um, you yeah. know, you, you feel a sense of purpose towards something that's far greater. And right. I, think, I think that is an important thing that music should do because, only when you spread your tentacles do you do you yes. get back. So I think there are there are so many possibilities and opportunities now to reach music to different people and through through different avenues and and having things online has made that that much easier now. And I think right. it's musicians' responsibility to to do that. Right. Do you think that musicians coming together, especially younger musicians uh, like yourself, today's musicians, forming some sort of an informal collective, getting together and addressing all these issues that affect them all, do, do you think there is a possibility of working together with your colleagues and uh, you know, certainly. other musicians? Certainly, certainly. I think, I think the good thing with this generation is that we all think similarly and um, mm -hmm. we all... Uh, agree on on things that can be improved upon so uh, having a collective will certainly help influence things for the better and um, I think we've had the YACM which is which has really yeah. done done fantastic stuff yeah yeah, yeah. so we can yeah. we can take a leaf out of their book and and see what we can do differently and help change things yeah. about a little bit yeah Lovely. So before I go, uh, Aishwarya, what are you working on right now? Concerts, any any other plans, projects? So yes, there are some concerts in the offing now after the brief hiatus we've had with with COVID yeah. and it's and it's around. Right. So right. yes, some some recordings, some concerts for Ramnavmi, some concerts for organizations overseas and uh, mm -hmm. And some, yeah, and some collaborations with some musicians. 
So these are things that I'm looking forward to. It's it's nice to finally be back and singing to audiences again. So I'm looking forward to that. That's lovely. So thank you. It's been wonderful talking to you. And all the very best, Aishwarya. Thank you so much, thank Devina. You. Thank you. I enjoy chatting up with you. Thank, thank you. you. Looking forward. Like, Bye. Bye. Bye.